I should say, start with your book, but for people that talk about evolution like life and human gets the Latin right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, which, God. I, which I think is insane. Well, I'll talk a little bit about that. Because it was uh, a problematic transition for me. Given variety, where I come from, like, so <laughs> like you know, yeah. um, so we're gonna start the talk. So if you can take your seats, we appreciate that. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for showing up today. Um, we are really excited to have Lizzie Kroll uh, visit us on campus to talk about the economic superorganism. Um, I guess first I'll introduce myself. I'm Rigo Malgor. I'm a PhD candidate in ecological economics at the University of Vermont. Um, and I'm the president of Rethinking Economics, economics UVM. Uh, Rethinking Economics UVM has a mission to foster diversity of economic thought among the UVM community and beyond by engaging in co-learning or diverse economic education to help us work towards well-being economies that are sustainable, just, and sufficiently meeting people's needs within planetary boundaries. So, a little bit about Lizzie Kroll. Who I met like 10 years ago, is it? 10 years ago? When I was a little kid. Um, <laughs> right. Um, and I was a young woman. <laughs> yeah. So, Dr. Lizzie Kroll is an emerita professor of economics at the State University of New York at Cortland. Lizzie holds bachelor's of science in anthropology, in postgraduate studies in biology and economics, and a PhD in economics, all from University of Utah. Um, Lisi has published extensively in the areas of political economy, human ecology, and evolution and evolution of economic systems. She has also taught courses in ecological economics, political economy of women, political economy, and social thought. Her research is oriented to question to questions concerning the formidable contradictions and challenges in altering the, the dynamic and structure of the economy to comport to the biophysical limitations and wild impulse of the earth. She's an interdisciplinary researcher at doing that. Um, so this research led, led Lizzie to publish her new book, Bitter Harvest, an inquiry into the war between the economy and earth, which is shown over <laughs> there. Um, her previous book, Probing Up, Domesticating Land in US History from 2010, explores interconnections of the economy, culture, and land. Lizzie has been a Fulbright Scholar, SUNY, the State University of New York, uh, Senior Scholar, and the State University of New York Chancellor's Award for Research recipient. Lizzie has collaborated in a variety of organizations, most recently with the Land Institute's Ecosphere Studies and New Perennials uh, Project Initiative. She was also most recently uh, a board member of the International Society for Ecological Economics. So, without further ado, take the microphone. Take it away. Well, thank you. <laughs> many, many thanks to Rico for inviting me here today because it's really nice to be able to uh, come here and talk about some of my ideas um, with this dynamic bunch. Um, Rigo asked specifically that I talk to you about the influence of heterodox economics on my work, and in particular on my uh, book, Bitter Harvest, um, which I've just published with SUNY Press. Um, and I guess I do uh, heterodox economics, but uh, I also do what I consider transdisciplinary work, because I use a lot of evolutionary uh, biology in my work. Um, I don't consider what I've come up with truth. Uh, I think we're all just kind of trying to sort out a lot of complexity and we kind of peel different layers of the onion and have different stories. Uh, and there's something to be garnered from all of that. Um, mine is a book about the formation of what I call the economic superorganism. And the economic superorganism is a particular kind of economic system, 
that began with the cultivation of annual grains. It was a wholly different economic system that humans had been engaged in for the 200 to 300 year uh, history uh, before that revolution. Um, it reconfigured their relationship to each other. And more importantly, in some sense, it reconfigured their relationship to the earth. And I believe it ultimately landed us here with this mess we have on our hands. And it is a mess. So I've been really interested in the formation of this system, uh, its structure and dynamic and its movement over time. That's what has fascinated me. Uh, and I've been open to what I could garner from that, even though there were some things that I garnered from that study that made me really uncomfortable. Uh, now, I don't want this to devolve into some autobiographical account of writing this book, uh, which was an arduous kind of process. But a limited autobiography uh, um, is important because it provides context for my uh, uh, ideas. And I think what this might show that might be relevant to you is that it's okay to stand out of the main currents of thought. It's uncomfortable and it's oftentimes isolating and lonely. But I think that nobody has a blueprint for the way forward. And so the multitude of ideas that can come forth to try to give insight into where we stand, how we got here, and how we move forward is really, really important. Now, I didn't start out as an ecological economist, okay? And simply because the institution where I did my graduate work didn't have any uh, ability to study even environmental economics at a graduate level, and ecological economics was just an emerging field. I chose the graduate school that I chose because I wanted to study in a program that was not narrowly framed by neoclassical economics, which I didn't find particularly compelling, since when I looked out at the world, I saw a world of class structure, I saw a world of inequality, I saw a world of exploitation. I saw a world of ecological degradation. I didn't see a world of equilibrium and some kind of bliss point of maximum collective utility. It's fair to say that at the time, if I hadn't had the option to study in a heterodox program, I might not have studied economics at all. Uh, so I found a fit at the University of Utah uh, in the early 1980s, uh, which might seem odd to you given that Utah is the quintessential red state. And there's a whole uh, story about that, which I won't go into because it will take us too far afield. Uh, but at the time, there were only a few PhD programs uh, that offered heterodox economics, and Utah happened to be one of them. So I found myself at the right place, the right time, and I earned a PhD in economics with a specialty in labor economics uh, and a particular interest at the time in the inequality as it pertained to women. A lot of women in my generation who went into PhD programs in economics did the same thing. Uh, I definitely didn't see that women who at the time earned 60 cents to, to the dollar uh, men earned and were occupationally segregated uh, into mostly dead end jobs uh, did that out of choice uh, and utility maximizing decisions. So I was influenced at the time mostly by what I refer to as evolutionary or institutional economics, kind of in the vein of Thorstein Veblen. I was also influenced by Carl Polanyi, and I was most influenced by the expansive ideas of Marx and Engels um, and their legacy through Baron and Sweezy and their work on monopoly capital. Um, and I've been especially drawn to the methodology of these thinkers um, because I like the idea of viewing economic systems as changing over time. So their work was always historical and dynamic, okay? Um, and I've been uh, drawn to paradigms that freed me from what Georgesco Rogan labeled the timeless kinematics of neoclassical economics. I've also been drawn 
to paradigms that highlight class inequality, uh, exploitation, instability, that sort of thing in the economic system. Having said all of that, I've never been narrowly dogmatic or dogmatically tied to any one paradigm or particular school of thought. Um, and along the way, I must admit that I developed a certain kind of respect for Adam Smith because Adam Smith was an expansive thinker. He had a sense for trying to sort out a system, a complex system, uh, out of the chaos that he saw around him. And he ultimately went back to human nature in his inquiry about the economy. And I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. Um, the closest thing I came to during my graduate work uh, in ecological economics was that in a history of economic thought course, I had an institutional economist teaching that course who had us read um, the entropy law and the economic process. So I ultimately landed in a radical economics department uh, in SUNY, uh, SUNY Cortland in the early 1990s. And at the time, nobody was teaching. They had an environmental economics course on the books, but nobody was teaching it. Um, radicals, I have to say, for the most part, weren't thinking about the environment. They weren't. I was hired to teach political economy of women, which I did for several decades. And that work actually helped me to um, delve more fully into the complexity of the division of labor, uh, the organization of work, social labor, and processes of exploitation. I made the decision to teach environmental economics, that course on the books, because nobody else wanted to teach it. And I had this interest in the relationship of humans to the more than human world and how that relationship became contextualized in economic systems. Um, and so I started teaching that course. I was, like most of you, influenced by the work of human uh, Herman Daly and this impossibility of growth on a finite planet. And I was also influenced by Georgesco Rodin and his entropy law, uh, law. And I came to some radical literature, because there was some radical literature, mostly uh, done, I think, by sociologists. I think James O'Connor was a sociologist and not an economist, I'm not sure, but he started talking about the second contradiction of capital. But I have to admit that I became frustrated with ecological economics because I thought it had a rather limited and narrow approach to capitalism, especially given my heterodox background, and a somewhat superficial, what I call superficial materialism that had not risen to uh, risen sufficiently to the challenge of explaining economic system formation and change over time. Um, it did show that the economy was connected to the earth, and that was not nothing, because that had been lost from economic thought. Um, and it also put the issue of scale front and center, and that was not nothing. Again, radical economists were not talking about the limits to growth at the time. Daly's approach... Uh, talked about the need to manage scale and redistribute income, um, but there was a little focus on the dynamic and structure of the economic sufficient, uh, system sufficient to explain its imperative of growth and how it reliably generated inequality. Georgesco Rodin had more appreciation for this dynamic life of the system and recognized in his words, and these will be familiar to you, I'm sure, the entropy law is the only natural law that does not predict quantitatively. It does not specify how great the increase should be at a future moment or what particular entropic pattern will result. Because of this fact, there is an entropic indeterminateness in the real world, which allows life to acquire endless spectrum of forms. And I would say it allows for different economic system, systems. Unfortunately, he didn't explore those systems 
in detail, okay? And he also suggested that the roots of growth lay deep in human nature. And he advised that economists should look at the economic process from a physiological and evolutionary perspective in a dialectical manner. So I like that about Georgesco Rogan. That challenge has yet to reach its full potential in ecological economics. In the end, it seemed that Georgesco Rogan's legacy went in the direction of concentrating on energy and the importance of the entropy law in highlighting irreversibilities and limits. Uh, and that was especially relevant in this era of fossil fuels. Okay? So ecological economics attempted to reconnect the economy to the earth. But again, in my mind, it was also important to understand how it had become, how it had come to function almost as if the earth was irrelevant. It seemed to we, me that we have an economic system, and, and this is the complexity of what we confront, that we have an economic system that is a material system. Um, but that's, at the same time, we have a system that functions as if it's not a material system. It is a system with an impulse to expand, that reliably generates inequality, it's subject to depressions, and stagnation because of its internal logic and not necessarily because of some resource constraint, okay? So it isn't just necessary to highlight that the economy is materially connected, okay? It is also necessarily necessary to understand how it becomes insular from the earth, okay? And I became interested in this bizarre duality because that's the reality I saw before me. This rather bizarre alienation, if you will, of the economic system um, from the earth, okay? Um, it's often blamed on economic thought. Hence the concentration on neoclassical economics. But I don't think it's a problem with economic thought only. It's an actual reality that we confront that is very complicated. Now, let me introduce another thread to my thinking. In 1995, I was assisting my stepfather, who was a human ecologist, his name is Paul Shepard, to bring together his last uh, books. He was dying of lung cancer and time was running out. And I was curious about his work. He was the person who handed me Herman Daly's book toward a steady state economy. And he, had, he had done that several years before that. And Paul had done a lot of foundational work on hunter and gatherers and the significance of the agricultural revolution in reframing the human relationship to earth. He had done a lot of work on that. So I became interested in how agriculture had altered the relationship of the earth. He had not concentrated on economic systems but I was interested in economic systems. Um, the focus of the importance of the agricultural revolution in resetting the human relationship to the earth and resetting an economic pattern um, put me at odds with most ecological economists who were not thinking about that and most radicals who were concentrating on capital. So I found myself in a very isolated position and it was in that context that I was going through some of his letters and I came across a letter from John Gowdy to Paul Shepard. John was trying to get a, uh, um, uh, Paul to submit one of his essays for his hunter and gatherer book that he was putting together. And I remember thinking, wow, there's actually another economist who thinks that this might be interesting, or that this is important. Um, fast forward another decade, and this is my connection with Charlie Hall. Through my connection with Charlie Hall, I met John Gowdy. I also met uh, Kent Flickard through him. Um, 
And John and I had a commonality, as Regal pointed out, in that we both had undergraduate degrees in anthropology and not in economics, um, and a great appreciation for the significance of the agricultural revolution, okay, and the way it had shifted the human relationship to Earth. One day, John came to me, and he said to me, have you ever thought about looking at agricultural insects? My answer, no. <laughs> Do you think it would be worthwhile to look at agricultural insects? My answer, yes. So that became our, began our foundational work on ultrasociality. Uh, I might have been the only person at the time who thought it might be interesting to look at agricultural insect superorganisms and compare them to humans that had made the transition to agriculture, okay? The challenge, of course, of engaging this curiosity was that it necess necessitated some uh, investment in exploring the commonalities of these rather diverse species. It was clear that the commonality lay in an evolved sociality, but also the way this sociality had become structured similarly in an agricultural system. So we began to look at the literature, John had already looked at it, but I began to look at the literature on, the, on evolution and particularly the evolution of socia sociality. Uh, through my, and I also was drawn to this through my appreciation of Marx. Because one of my favorite quotes of Marx is the relation between the organic body of the human being and the inorganic world is one that is conditioned by the subsistence needs of human beings and their capacity through social labor to transform the external conditions of nature into a means of satisfying these needs. Okay? Marx was very interested in social aid, uh, labor, and actually there were a lot of economists that were uh, interested in social labor. Adam Smith starts out his uh, Wealth of Nations, the first three chapters are on the division of labor. He takes it in a different direction, of course. But keep in mind, I had been groomed as a radical feminist economist, okay, who rejected genetic explanations for things that were socially constructed. And I say this because I want you to appreciate the kind of dissonance it caused for me to make this leap. And as a feminist, I was especially wary of reductionistic thinking. I didn't like sociobiology, period. And I certainly didn't like the kind of sociobiology sociobiology that had emerged in the 1970s. Um, but over time, I came to uh, really appreciate the work of E.O. Wilson and had great, great affinity. I benefited greatly from the work that he did, but then E.O. Wilson had, had his own evolution, uh, to be sure, okay? In evolutionary parlance, I found myself attached to group and multi-level selection, and I began to interpret the evolution of the agricultural system in a different light. It was an expression of social evolution. Even so, I differed with this group, um, because to those evolutionary biologists interested in group selection, the pinnacle of the evolution of uh, the, the pinnacle of the, of the evolution of our sociality was the capacity for culture. And, and, and culture was then used to explain the agricultural revolution. Okay? But this is what bothered me. What bothered me was this. Insect superorganisms engage agriculture. And one heart can hardly claim, and they have a structure and dynamic to their economic life that is very similar to the structure and dynamic of economic life that humans take on with agriculture. And one can hardly claim that they have culture, although John Madden has sometimes argued with me about that. 
That's when I started to think about agriculture and the agricultural system as a universal system that had captured many species. And I started thinking that the formation of the agricultural system, that in that formation, culture helped to elaborate the division of labor, much like mutation and selection had elaborated the division of labor in insect uh, superorganisms that were practicing agriculture. But in, in the end, the outcome's the same. The same kind of economic system is formed, and what I call an economic superorganism. So culture isn't the main story in my thinking. The whole story is that an evolved sociality was hijacked by an emergent agricultural system with its complex feedback loops. And I started wondering where economic systems lay in the complexity of evolution. I could see that the agricultural system becomes its own thing with its particular feedback loops. And most importantly, is it is a system where human economic life has been removed from the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world. This may seem counterintuitive, but it's actually true because the interaction with more than human world is reduced to the end to the cycle of annual grades. Humans were no longer embedded in the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world in the same way. Interdependence, division of labor around cultivation form a, a, a foundational stanchion for a different kind of economic system. And it's true, uh, and this is true for all species that cultivate feedback ensue between population, division of labor, cultivation, population, division of labor, which are especially pronounced for humans. With the co-evolution of humans, their co-evolution is with annual grains and their sociality. So it's the co-evolution of their sociality and annual grains that's important and the human capacity for culture. The system is pr profoundly expansionary. So the energetics and expression of sociality in an agricultural system are entirely different than they were for humans that were engaged in a hunting and gathering system. Uh, it's a particular play. Grain agriculture, the agricultural revolution is a particular play on sociality, okay? A particular type of material system. And in my thinking, a new hole in the complexity of social evolution. For humans, there are many elaborations to the system, hierarchy, uh, markets, money, debt, irrigation, property, okay? Because humans are not insects, okay? And that means they have elaborations that insects don't have. But in my mind, these elaborations, in some sense, needed to be um, separated from the foundational architecture of an agricultural system, which I found to be universal. Okay? So I thought you could explain a lot about the agricultural revolution without resorting to culture and without resorting to human intelligence. Okay? The truth is our collective alienation embodied in an economic system, contextualized in this economic superorganism has been with us a long time. Now, the foundational system put in play with grain agriculture did not change, has not changed. Interdependence, Expansion and surplus, profound duality between humans and earth embodied in an economic system that is a thing unto itself. Well, of course, it's not a thing unto itself because it's a material system. And so you start after the agricultural revolution to see the collapse of civilizations, okay? 
Um, again, insects are not humans. Humans are individually intelligent. They carry their innovations forward from generation to generation. So culture and technology are cumulative and additive. They develop hierarchies and institutions like markets that feed back into the system. So humans have enhanced feedback loops that insects don't have, have. But despite all of this, you can say all of these elaborations that humans have merely extend and, and elaborate this foundational system that gets going with agriculture. Now we'll get to capitalism. I ultimately label capitalism as a system within a system. The presence of surplus doesn't change, its form does. Human to human relationships are altered slightly, but there's a different relationship than there was with the hunting and gathering system. And there is profound material interdependence and the presence of hierarchy. All of those things are characteristics of the capitalist system. And I see that the duality that I saw being formed with the agricultural system um, became ever deeper and exaggerated with capitalism. Now, there are a few things you need to be aware of, and my radical roots also brought me back to this about capitalism. Capitalism was a fully established system before the Industrial Revolution. Okay? Yes, a change occurred in capitalism when it started using fossil fuels. There's no question about that. But the form of surplus did not change because surplus that began with agriculture had evolved over time. And it had now taken on, as markets had evolved, and it had now taken on an institutional uh, form, the institutional form of profit, okay? Now, you can look at that a number of different ways. In a Marxian sense, the form of surplus in a capitalist system is obtained by extracting part of the value produced by workers and translating that into profit or by tapping into what Jason Moore calls cheap natures, the profit that can be made from slavery and um, uh, the rape of the earth, for example. But profit is an institutional, what I call an institutional form of surplus that itself fits into a system. And here I want to stress something that I think Marx understood that most of us have forgotten. The problem is not the capitalist. The problem is the capitalist system. And that's a more formidable profit problem. Okay? I don't doubt that there's plenty of greed. And I don't doubt that government often seems to uh, 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 reinforce the powers that be, okay? Um, and I don't doubt that the economically powerful are more powerful than they've ever been, okay? But unfortunately, th I think our problem is more foundational. Um, I like this quote, another quote from Marx, who says, the capitalist shares with the miser the passion for wealth as wealth. But that which in the miser is a mere idiosyncrasy is in the capitalist the effect of a social mechanism of which he is but one of the wheels. The development of capitalist production compels him to constantly extend, to keep constantly extending his capital in order to preserve it. I also want to stress this. While the energetics of an economic system are clearly important, they are not the whole picture of an economic system. Capitalism was a system already disconnected, in a way, from the more than human world, okay? With its institutional form of surplus, 
But there is no question that it becomes even more disconnected with the advent of fossil fuels. There's no question about it. Because what happens is that the dynamic life of profit making begins to seem unlimited. Okay? So capitalism sets up more profound tensions in the system. Tensions that are in, independent of biophysical factors. For example, the problems of overproduction, underconsumption, savings and investment not being equal, more pronounced depressions, ever increasing crises, and the constant imperative to find new markets. Okay? So it is a rather bizarre thing. And this is what I concentrated on. It's a rather bizarre thing that as the system becomes more expansive in its material demands, it becomes in some way more insular and self-referential as an economic system. The duality began, that began with the agricultural revolution comes full circle with the industrial revolution and its marriage to capitalism where I believe the economy functions in a supra-material sense at the same time it has never been more material, okay? In its human demands on the earth. It doesn't surprise me that economists forgot about the connection of economy to earth. In some sense, this disposition reflected something real. In my work, I ultimately divide the history of thought and the history of economists, and I didn't do an expansive job of this, but I divide economists into two different groups, depending on whether the relationship of the system to the earth was central to their analysis. I call them the unearthly, philosophers and the earthly philosophers uh, playing on Robert Heilbronner's book, The Worldly Philosophers. And when I did this, I found strange bedfellows because I ended up with Marx and Bedlin and the neoclassicals, Keynes and Adam Smith, all in the camp of the unearthly philosophers. Daily Georgesco Brogan, John Bellamy Foster, Paul Burkett, Jason Moore, I put in the camp of the earthly philosophers because the relationship of the economy to the earth was the central focus of their analysis. Now I have to qualify what I'm gonna say here or you'll get confused. John Bellamy Foster, how many of you are familiar with John Bellamy Foster? So some of you are. He's a sociologist and he's done a tremendous amount of work on trying to highlight Marx's ecology, okay? Um, precisely because Marx and Engels had been accused of having left the earth out of their analysis, okay? He's been on the defensive about that for several decades, and rightly so, okay? In a sense, ecological economics announced the postmortem on Marx prematurely. Having said that, much of Marx's system analysis was not Earth-centered. So there is truth to that too. The crisis of capitalism doesn't occur for earthly reasons, okay? It rises, uh, rises in a Marxian analysis out of the contradictions inherent in the system of profit-making, okay? Now, in my book, I didn't do a detailed analysis of the unearthly philosophers to find out whether or not they ever mentioned the earth, okay? That wasn't my point. My position was that the worldly philosophers, to use Heilbronner's terminology, were focused on an economic system that clearly functioned by its own logic, its own internal structure and dynamic, and that logic was removed from its biophysical foundations. At the same time, it was clearly a material system. Again, this is the duality that I see, okay? 
And this fit in with the duality that I saw beginning with the agricultural revolution. The economy had been a thing unto itself removed from the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world for 10,000 years. Yes, its form had changed. Uh, surplus had taken an institutional form of profit. But the foundational impulse and structure of the economic superorganism vis-a-vis -vis the earth had not changed. Now, the earthly philosophers had been centered on reconnecting the earth, the economy to the earth. The connection of economy to earth by EE, ecological economics, has been mostly descriptive. Important to be sure, but descriptive. In my mind, materialism needs to reach deep into the realm of understanding the formation of an economic system and this entropic indeterminateness that Georgesco Rogan refers to. Materialism needs to tap deep into the history of our individual and collective relationship with the more than human world. And more importantly, how that relationship takes form in an economic system. I believe that the deep materialism of Marx and Engels was leading them in the direction that I had gone in my exploration had they had greater understanding of evolution. And it might have refocused their attention, not so narrowly on class, but instead on a more fundamental relationship. And that was the relationship between humans and the earth. They might have become refocused in that way, in a deeper ecology. My critique of the ecological political economists, uh, the other thread of the earthly philosophers, was that they had not taken the materialist challenge of Marx far enough either. Because they stopped with capitalism and missed the fact that capitalism was a system within a system that it was a system that had fundamentally altered the human relationship to the earth. Had they extended the materialism that began with Marx further back, they might have understood more fully that out of our social evolution and the fact that uh, uh, we had engaged agriculture, our relationship our collective relationship with the earth had been fundamentally altered there. It hadn't simply become with capitalism. It didn't begin with capitalism, this alienation, nor the economic system that we find ourselves with now. I think they too might have focused more on the relationship between the evolution of social humans and earth, okay? And going back into deep history, that kind of deep history, I think, is a way, uh, if you will, to really think about what it means for humans and their economic system to be embedded in the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world. We're not talking about trying to create a safe operating space for humans on Earth. We're trying to create a safe operating space for the more than human world. World. And that's the different question. So my radical and heterodox roots, in the end, left me with a sense of the importance of a deeper materialism. Okay, One that takes us back to our social evolution in dialectical dance with the earth, and one that tries to find the roots of our alienation from the earth, and then give us insight into more expansively think about how we might reconnect, okay? Now, let me just say a few other marginal things about things I've come to out of this work that I've done. I'm reticent to talk about human nature. I see that humans became homo, what I call homo sapiens agricultural with the and members of the economic superorganism with the agricultural revolution. 
Our nature is clearly a complex matter, and it is surely contextual. What I don't want is to have questions of our nature degenerate into discussions of all the ways that humans are special and exceptional at the expense of never talking about all the ways they are not. The whole point, in a sense, of the comparisons with ants and termites was to say, even in the ways that we think we're different, we're not that different. And this should make us a bit more humble and a bit more critical and discerning about our power to change things. I also believe that evolution should not be imbued with teleological purpose. Both the seemingly perfect and the imperfect abound in the evolutionary sphere. It's even brought me to say, which I thought I'd never say, that I'm not even sure that this economic system can be considered unnatural. That's bothered me. I also think that from the perspective of evolution, yes, we can say we are not homo economicus. Okay? We can say that we're caught in a problematic mismatch between our inclinations in this modern technological world we find ourselves in. But for me, the benefit of evolution is to understand the evolution of humans into a cultural cooperative species and then to understand the co-evolutionary co -evolutionary dance of that sociality and annual brains and the formation of the economic superorganism a species with a profoundly different and altered collective relationship with Earth. I would go a step further and say evolutionary processes should not be narrow, narrowly confined to genetic change. I believe it's quite possible the agricultural revolution was a major, and I mean this in an evolutionary sense, was a major evolutionary transition uh, for those species that engaged it. And in humans, this occurred with minimal genetic change. And I'm left wondering where the economic superorganism as a new whole lies in the complexity of evolution. And this, I can assure you, has put me at odds with evolutionary biologists. It seems to me we find ourselves two things at once. We are Homo sapiens sapiens, the product of our Pleistocene evolution, and the Homo sapiens agricultural eye, a species honed in the Holocene and on our particularly problematic path that we can't seem to alter to save our collective souls. So we're caught in kind of a liminal space between determinism and intentionality, between what we can do and what we're caught up in. And so in that world, it's important to focus, to really focus on what we're doing. Okay? And I'll stop there. That's enough. Wow, well, that was incredible. I'm going to give people a few minutes to go get some pizza since the pizza just arrived, and I really appreciate people who brought it in. And then we'll have like a little bit of food. I'll go back for a second. Rest for sure. That's always a try. I hope.
So that that talk was, I mean, every time I hear Lizzie talk, I just get mind blown because I keep learning more and more on what she's trying to tell us. It's really complex. Um, yeah, it is it's really complex stuff. And I just love how she takes it all in like in all these different perspectives and brings them in to tell a story. But I guess one second, are we good with audio? We're good. Right. Um, I guess my first question would be, by the way, I want people to ask questions. So if by the way, some of you read the book, some of it, so if you have any questions based on that, that would be great. But um, when we, you know, we just got the IPCC report uh, a couple of days ago, and and the report basically said that uh, if we don't transform our economic system in the next ten years or so, we can say we can just forget about staying within the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase that they've been talking about for decades, right? So basically, we're, we're almost like going back to the original Paris Agreement. From 2015, when they when they were saying, okay, we, we need to stay within the two degrees Celsius, and in 2018, the IPCC the told us that we have to stay within 1.5, and now we're kind of like going back to the original. So I, I was just I was just curious about your thoughts about this, and how do we connect it to this? You know, whether or not the system is that deterministic for us to shift it in a way. I know it's not an easy question, but... I mean, I hate to answer the question, honestly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's impossible to switch the system in the next 10 years. I think that's not possible. So how, how do you deal with it? And how did I deal with it? I guess I dealt with, but I think what we can do is we can we can focus our attention um, in particular ways that are productive. For example, not getting on the bandwagon of simply saying we need to switch to renewable energy. I mean, when you start to get into the logistics of that and the reality of that and the demands of that and the infrastructure needed and the distributional problems that we still have to deal with in all of that. You understand that, yes, of course, we need to try to make a, a transition to renewable energy but we need to downsize our energy demands. So it's not just a matter of transitioning to renewable energy and, 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 and then moving on with business as usual. Business, not doing business as usual has to mean more than um, simply uh, making some transition to renewable energy, because I don't think anybody really knows where that transition can or will take us, exactly what it will look like. We should be talking about whether that transition should be privately owned, should it be for part of the for-profit system. We should be talking about the reality of limits in that transition. Those are the things we should be talking about. So. One of the things that really uh, irritated me about uh, uh, Biden um, was when he went to, I don't know if it's GM that makes the Humvee, is it GM that makes the Humvee? But early in his presidency, he went to the Humvee factory and they had an electric Humvee and he got in this Humvee and rode around in this electric Humvee and I thought, God, 
Is that where we're at? <laughs> you know, just exemplified. Like we can really carry on with everything we're doing now just with renewable energy. And so I think that's one thing that you know you can you can focus on. For me, and I talk a little bit about this in the book, this kind of deeper ecology and the necessity of trying to create a safe operating space for the more than human world makes me think there's almost nothing more important than conservation right now. It's absolutely essential because it, in a sense, it's a way to set up a when to stop kind of place. So I think conservation work is really important. So can we, can we stop this train? And no, I don't think so. But I think we can hone our understanding of what we need to do and really kind of concentrate, change conversations um, enough to really have our work be somewhat revolutionary. So you're almost suggesting what E.O. Wilson said a few years ago in his book about leaving 50% of the earth be. <laughs> and then just try to use the other one as efficiently as you can. Um, but yeah, conservation. So we're going to move. I mean, do you guys have any questions? Josh? Um, I think my voice is big enough. Um, but uh, you made the comment that you don't believe evolution is teleological, but with cultural evolution, our goal of many of us here is to intentionally change our culture to better fit within the constraints of the planet, which means can changing our economic system profoundly. And I look at our economic system as one element of our culture. And if we're really, so do you think that essentially that um, we should be trying to intentionally direct cultural evolution towards a more sustainable path? Or do you think even there, uh, you know, that, that strikes me as goal oriented, it's teleological. I think what I meant by evolution not being teleological is that I think we, there were evolutionary processes involved that created the, I mean, that's a good question, Joss, uh, that created the economic superorganism. Like, what I really like the idea that. And it resonates with me that it wasn't purely people saying this is what we need to do. Okay, there were forces at work and systems get going that are complex things and they may have less to do with us than we think they do. We elaborate them in certain ways. And I think, the, I think in some sense the, the, the jury's out on that. So in evolutionary biology, the evolution of the capacity for culture was honed during the Pleistocene when there were a lot of climactic changes going on. And evolutionary biologists generally think about it as adaptive. That was uh, uh, something that worked in our favor to evolve in that way because culture would allow you to develop ways of dealing with those climatic changes and then passing them on from generation to generation. In this world that we're in now, on the upper end of these exponential curves, I wonder whether culture is a lag or whether it is a leader, okay? Because we're in a different time constraint. You know, if we're talking about 10 years to uh, change the economic structure, that's a pretty pretty short period of time. And I don't think the cultural change may have evolved, it, it may have evolved and been a benefit because it made us more adaptable. I don't know that it has the same adaptive capacity in the upper neck of the exponential growth curves that we're on right now. So I think that's a question. I don't know what we can do. I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. Uh, and that's why I say I think we're caught between intentionality, what we can intentionally do, and kind of forces that we're stuck with and sort of navigating that uh, 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 space. 
Um, I think that's a very difficult thing to do. So for me, the teleological part of it was that we evolved this economic superorganism. It was a decidedly different relationship between humans and Earth. I don't think there was any way of knowing where that was going to go. Evolution doesn't know where that's going to go. But it went the way that it went. And, um, and so we may just have an imperfect result on our hands that's, I don't know how it's going to go down. If that makes sense. If you told me you did know, I'd be suspect. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've got the I've got the the truth. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. No, it is really tricky, by the way. Can you define teleological just for the people who? Never it just that? means it has it kind of has a purpose. It's it it, it has a purpose. Yeah. And I don't think evolution is, has a purpose in that way. I agree totally with biological evolution. Yeah. So. Sam. Uh, so where I'm from, the original peoples in the Pacific Northwest, United States, didn't have grain agriculture, but because of the abundance of their environment with salmon and fruit, um, had some of these features that you identify with grain agriculture and the separation from natural cycles and um, like the alienation from the earth. Um, hierarchy that slaves, um, nothing like capitalism, but some some of those features of early agricultural civilizations, which makes me wonder, like, what are the, like, James Scott has his um, features of grain agriculture, the grains are like storable and divisible and countable and all these things that, that lead to the emergence of states, and I'm curious if you have, like, attributes of grain agriculture that lead to uh, that separation from the natural world that you, you date to the agricultural world. We have a couple questions there, actually. So let me just say something about the Pacific Northwest peoples and the surplus there. Yes, there is surplus in the, and, and hierarchy develops. Okay. What I looked for in my work was sort of historians probably hate me. <laughs> and maybe some anthropologists too, because I really took a broad kind of stroke. So you can have these exceptions. Yes, if you're in the Pacific Northwest where you have this surplus, you may get hierarchy, okay? But most of hunting and gathering societies were not hierarchical, and that's because they had a certain kind of pattern, economic pattern of feedback loops. Um, and so I was looking for this kind of more um, trend, broad trend that I saw uh, emerging. James Scott is interesting. Um, annual grains and their coevolution with social humans is really interesting. Annual grains are a really bad proposition, not for coevolution, but for ecological reasons. But they were abundant during the Holocene morning. And they're a good coevolutionary option them every year. Okay? And so you can engage in selection with those grains and have that selection process play out very, very quickly. Um, but some of the selection that occurred with annual grains doesn't even have to do with intentionality. Okay, it was more accidental. If you have a feedback loops developing between the cultivation of annual grains and population growth and a more elaborate division of labor, which you do, and aren't clear how much you're going to get each year because they're annual grains and production can vary from year to year. There is always the imperative to plant as many as you can 
to expand production. So I think in part implicit in that or, or kind of in, inherent to that particular kind of thing, there was an expansionary dynamic. You have these feedback loops going on, but you also have these traits of annual grains. And annual grains um, also are an ecological disaster, okay, in terms of soil erosion. So how do you how do you counteract the ecological disaster? Well, you try to expand. So it's another kind of feature, kind of inherent to those annual grains that makes it a really expansionary kind of proposition. And then, you know, you have humans who have, um, you know, technological abilities and you have surplus being produced because there's an imperative to produce surplus because you want to guard against bad years and that kind of opens the door for hierarchy. And so, I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but when I was thinking about it, I thought about all of that as kind of lending to this expansionary dynamic of these annual grains. And annual grains, you know, interface with the division of labor really in really interesting ways too, because um, work becomes routinized and standardized and and, um, and you can actually uh, implement kind of a detailed division of labor around that routinization and standardization, which gives you efficiencies uh, that expand things as well, if that makes sense. I mean, I think James Scott says that we're disciplined by the metronome of our crops. Um, but I looked at that kind of in the context of the division of labor. And then, of course, you get the elaboration of the social development <coughs> around that surplus, too, and all of that. So I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I have not had a chance to read your book yet, so you might have addressed this in your book. I will read your book to find out, but I'm curious, uh, kind of another parallel thread that I've been following has been some of the articles that are written that, um, that investigate the fact that many of the cereal grains that we use and many seed crops in general have modest amounts of opioid-like chemicals in them and that those chemicals when ingested can play with our opioid receptors in our nervous system, much the same way that you know, the modern opioid epidemic, epidemic uh, can. And so there's a number of folks, including folks in particular from Australia, who basically say that um, most of the places where great agriculture emerged it was actually more of a substance abuse sort of a thing because people got addicted to the opioid chemicals and then that's where the growth imperative came from. Um, I'm curious if you touched on that in your book or if you have any thoughts about that now. I didn't touch on it in my book, and I actually, I, I mean, I, I, I'd have to think about that. Um, I don't have any, uh, I don't know how that fed in, how, how, how that would feed into the expansionary dynamic. Uh, um, the basics of it is that our opioid receptors become less sensitive the more they get used. So you, you get a little bit, and then in order to get the same sense of pain relief, you have to have more over time. So is that why we're addicted to carbohydrates or something? I mean, I don't know. Um, I, mean I don't know if I would generalize it in that way. But. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought. I haven't. I haven't thought about that at all. Okay. I, uh, it's interesting to think about, but I haven't thought about it at all. Yeah. Yes. Uh, during your discussion of uh, the dialectic between like insects and humanity uh, evolving with agriculture, I couldn't help but be reminded of Bookchin's dialectical naturalism. I need to draw more from a Marxist perspective than an anarchist one, but has Bookchin's ideas of dialectical naturalism influenced your uh, train of thought at all? You know what? I can't say uh, because I did read Bookchin many, many years ago, but off the top of my head, I can't tell you what he said. 
So it may have infiltrated. What is the Bookchin's uh, dialectical naturalism? Uh, Bookchin essentially states that uh, ecolo- or humans have approached a unique version of ecology. Um, essentially, he defines first nature as unconscious ecology, ecology that is uh, not directed by a will or a culture, if you will, like you were talking about with insects. Uh, and humans have achieved what he calls second nature, uh, which is a divorce from what we could call natural sort of human ecology, natural social formations in terms of uh, human constructed social formations and thus have alienated ourselves from nature. Um, and he proposed, and he says that this is sort of like the, the cause of the environmental crisis. And his solution is uh, dialectically a uh, third nature, if you will, um, incorporating uh, elements of human ecology that were found sort of pre-capitalism as an in- interaction with the environment um, with our ability to consciously form our own social and cultural formations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. I think the thing that I would say is that um, I probably don't find a problem with that framework at all, except I would say that I, one of the things that looking at the, the similarity between ants and humans uh, in their agricultural societies um, taught me, and I don't, I don't know how else to explain this or to um, think about it. I think there's something foundational and universal in an agricultural system that is the same for humans and those agricultural insects, and so. Humans may have a second nature that these insects don't, but they also have more of a first nature that goes into the structure of those economic systems that they don't recognize. And so um, I'd have to look at Bookchin again. Maybe I, I, I will make me curious, but that's how I would, I guess that's how I would kind of think about what he re- what he says in relation to what what I say. Does that make sense? Okay. Hi. My turn. Um, so I have a question which is a theoretical. You uh, early in your, your talk you talked about the um, perhaps whether agricultural was an intrinsic structure in nature and that human beings adopted agriculture perhaps somewhat um, not as a cultural evolution, but because ecology just drove them in in that direction for the same reason that it drove insects in that direction? Would you like to clarify that a little bit or expand on that a little bit? Because I just, I'm not sure that I really fully understand. Well, I think they're, uh, if I can try to explain it, they are, and I suppose it has to do with, you know, what is an economic system? You know, there's system formation going on there that is playing on these different species, but it's playing on those different species in a, in a similar way. So both of those species have, or not both of those species, because there's many species of ants and termites that practice agriculture, so it's multitude of species. They haven't evolved social as sociality. You know, they came to agriculture as superorganisms. So they already have this evolved sociality in the same way that humans have an evolved sociality. They are fully cultural uh, 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 um, species by the time the agricultural revolution hits. Uh, I, I, I guess. I'm not sure I'm answering your question correctly, but the agricultural system seems to play on that sociality with those feedback loops in very similar ways. So agricultural insects become 
or uh, uh, insect superorganisms become agricultural superorganisms through a process of mutation and selection over millions and millions of years. And that expands their division of labor, um, which is genetically kind of programmed, partially, not entirely, but partially genetically programmed. Um, and that division of labor, you know, it's, it's an interdependent kind of structural whole and then they are, uh, it's being extended over time and cultivation has a certain play. You, you, you cultivate your, in more control of your energy and that's feeding back on population and feeding back on the division of labor. So in uh, a sense, it's, a, it's an intrinsic structure of, it comes to social species from nature. The difference, <coughs> the principal difference being that when it's adopted by human beings, human beings being cultural, and capable of cultural evolution in single generation, instead of relying on hundreds of generations, it can evolve cultures of agriculture very quickly and eventually elaborate into what we have today. Yes, exactly. And they can, um, uh, 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 also the annual grains have something to do with it. You know, that, that was their evolutionary dynamic. But I, I did come to the conclusion that the, the, what I call the economic superorganism, which was this kind of agricultural system, it's a universal system. And I, I did the best I could with it. I don't know that I knew exactly what to do with it. You know, because it made me think, what is an, what is an economic system? Because we do often think about it just in cultural terms, that it's a cultural thing. And it made me think, well, I don't know if it is entirely cultural. You know, there is this kind of mechanistic, mechanistic and feedback loop kind of thing going on with these systems. And there definitely seems to be this universal kind of system developing uh, with agriculture that I couldn't ignore because I'm interested in system formation. And also I was interested in it because, man, it seems like we can't change it. It just seems like the basic kind of dynamic and structure of that has been elaborated over the last 10,000 years, but we can't, we, we can't seem to alter it. So then I started thinking, well, you know, are all of our cultural, intelligent, inventive capabilities seem to have elaborated it, not altered it, not changed it in a different direction. And so there was a lot that came out of this for me that I didn't know quite what to do with and what economic systems are was the question, and where they lie in the matrix or the complexity of evolution was a, a question that emerged for me. So thank you for that. So we have one more question over there. Hey, um, actually you might have just partially answered this, uh, but um, I, I was curious, uh, these agricultural insects, did, did, did you see that they also become divorced from their environment in a way that you know has harmful side effects, or is it a more benign version? And if so, like what's the difference between their agriculture and ours? They're littler. <laughs> <laughs> for one thing, I think that's not nothing. They don't have the institutional elaborations that we have. Um, they have the capacity to have a, like a queen fly to another place if I think they sort of get filled up and recolonize in a different place. They seem to have evolved in um, a kind of rainforest environments where they have a continual supply of, like leaf cutter, leaf cutter ants have a continual supply of uh, leaves which feed their fungal gardens. Um, 
I don't think we think of them as an insular in the sense that, and, and their evolution has been a lot longer, more protracted kind of process. We don't think about their system as being insular in the way that I describe our system as being. Um, so, I can say we're disembedded from the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world in our system. And I suppose these ant superorganisms in a way are rather disembedded from the rhythm and dynamic of what's not in that system in a similar way, although we don't make the same pronouncements about them. I'm not sure I answered that question very well, but that's all I can say. Yeah, maybe they, maybe they could simply do less, you know, have less effects, or or like uh, was being alluded to earlier, some other things about our intelligence make us more able to run away with this process. In oh, for sure, much more accelerated fashion. Oh, for sure. And also, our since we plan institutions, the things since you said earlier, we can also have the capability of selecting for them and accelerating the evolution uh, process. And so, uh, yeah, maybe it's a number of factors. Yeah. But they also but account for an a disproportionate level of biomass. There's a very simple answer is it's coevolution. The ants evolved over genetically over sufficient time for the environment to also evolve genetically. Yeah. We evolve culturally. The genetic evolution cannot keep up with us. So nature cannot learn, if you will, the how to avoid the damage that human beings do. The uh, social insects never really learned how to do that kind of damage because it was all cold. Can I have one more question in the back of that? Um, yeah, thanks. Sure. You can, yeah, 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 yeah. I can hear you, but you've got to talk. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I wanted to ask about, or at least to, before I begin, wanted to sort of restate your thesis in the sense of you think of something like ultra-social sociality being driving factor towards the emergence of the economic superorganism that we are now. Is kind of that correct? Yeah. Um, where, I guess, would you see the emergence really coming out? Like for me, I would see something around the 15th century or 16th century when you see the homogenization of the world ecology that you know precipitate or that happened as a product of the colonization of the world that uh, started out in Europe. And um, where do you see the, the economic social organism uh, emerging more clearly, like in sort of the dialectical unfolding? And how does your thesis, I guess, is um, moderated by Peter Turgeon's, Peter Turgeon's argument that even more so than agriculture, war seems to be a, a bigger factor warfare driving uh, human complexity, at least based on the data basis that they've analyzed? Um, I think the, the form of the, what I call the economic superorganism was uh, evident long before uh, uh, the 1500s, 1600s, uh, when you know, you get the kind of global trading networks going on. And I mean, I think that all has to do with the general systems uh, kind of theory of sociologists about capitalism going much farther back. I think the economic superorganism goes back much farther than that. And you certainly see it forming with these, uh, the rise of city states uh, that's taking place. Um, Peter Churchin. Turchin, Peter Turchin? I forget his last name, Turchin. Turchin, I think. Um, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I think conflict could have, I, he's not the only one that kind of talks about this. I think uh, Sam Bowles also talks about it. Economist Sam Bowles also talks about it, uh, that this conflict creates uh, 
um, sociality, you know, kind of a, 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 an evolved sociality through uh, uh, war. Um, I, I don't know, I'd have to go back and read Peter Churchin again. So we have one more question over here and then we can be done. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I also wanted to thank you for coming to talk. Um, I had a question that you were talking about how important conservation work is right now. Um, my question is not as like interesting as the other ones, but um, I was just wondering, do you think that like conservation work is one of the most effective like jobs that younger people can get into like to help heal the system in the system right now? Or do you think there are other jobs that could be more effective? Or do you think it's just not, that's not like the way to do it? Well, I think conservation is a um, tremendously important. Um, we may be in a position where all we can do, and I use terminology that's not mine, um, but all we can do is save remnants at this point, but we should at least be doing that. Um, and so I, I just think it's tremendously important because I can't imagine what, I, I guess, you know, I think we have to think about it as a an evolutionary transition. Are we going to, you know, end up in the apogee of this long process where we're left with this wholly kind of managed or not so managed system and we don't have any of those ecologies or wild creatures or wild impulse uh, to uh, accompany us. I don't know. I don't know what that will do to us. It's not a place I really want to go, and that's where we're headed. So I just think conservation is, even if it's just saving remnants, it's tremendously important. And also, it helps to stop things. You know, it does draw a clear kind of when to stop rule. So, and I realize conservation itself is very complicated. So I get that. I just have a clarifying question. So um, when you say that you're not using your own terminology, when you're saying, is that on? You can hear you. Hello? Oh, cool. Uh, when you're saying that you're not using your own terminology for um, conserving remnants, uh, do you know who used that and also how they operationally define what a remnant was? I don't know how. It's uh, Wes Jackson um, from the Land Institute and a guy named Bob Jensen who have worked together uh, to write a book called An Inconvenient Ap Ap Apocalypse. And uh, they talk about saving remnants in there. And um, I'm not sure exactly how they operationalize that, how they define that. But I think the idea is that we can't, I think their idea was we cannot, we're, we're not gonna be able to, we, we can't fully stop this. So saving remnants might be what we do. So you might wanna pick up their book. Do. Um, speaking of the Land Institute, I wanted to ask, I know that a lot of folks at the Land Institute are working on, on developing perennial grains like Kernza, and I don't know how feasible it is at scale, I know the yields are substantially smaller at this point, but if we switch to perennial grains, would that make any sort of su substantial difference in terms of the economics of the organism, or are we, are we just past that at this point? That's a really complicated question, because um, I think we have to deal with the institutional form of surplus in our system. I don't think, I mean, that's something we don't want to face, but I don't think there's any getting around it. And it's, 
interesting that a lot of the currents of production is being subsumed within the, the system, the kind of for-profit agricultural system. So it's a much better ecological um, proposition. It may be restraining of the system in the sense that you simply can't produce as much grain through perennial grains as you would be uh, producing grains through uh, kind of industrial agricultural grain uh, production. Um, but if currents of production and the ownership of it and the marketing of it and the in integration of it into the economic system happens, then in the same way that it doesn't alter, it doesn't offer as much of a revolutionary option as it might otherwise. So that's what I would say, and I think they have grappled with that. I know Wes Jackson has about uh, uh, currents of production. You know, and I, I and I think with agriculture it's so complicated because you know you can ask questions. Um, you know, what's our challenge? To feed the world, or to produce food in an ecological manner? And again, you know, it may be the same kind of thing we get into as we get into with renewable energy. We may not be able to feed. 8 billion people if we produce food ecologically. So, you know, you have to, I think you have to kind of disaggregate those kinds of questions, if that makes sense. You. you know, but I know General Mills, for example, I think it's been involved in currents of production and, you know, so it's, 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 it's complicated. Well, Thank you so very much, uh, <laughs> Lizzie, Thank for, you, Rico. for coming to uh, UVM. Uh, we are very grateful that you drove from Cortland. Uh, I think it's like a six hour drive. And uh, just gonna stay over the night here and we're gonna, have, we're gonna have more talking, but I just wanna thank everyone who showed up. Uh, just stay engaged with Rethinking Economics UVM if you wanna learn more and just get engaged with the with the club. Um, you know where to find you know where to find us. Um, and just have a great weekend. Take care. And let me just say thank you so much uh, for coming and for all your questions and your curiosity. It's really uh, encouraging. So.